Good morning, everybody, and welcome back again to another early morning Sunday show with, once again, a catless host. Yes, Cat does say hi. He's outside doing cat things. Actually, I think my front yard's become the world's biggest litter box. Uh, at times when you're weeding the garden, you kind of understand where cats has been hiding. But that's the way it is. All right. It's nice and cold here in beautiful Midland, Michigan. That opening was uh, from Whiting Forest. It's a um, part of the gardens. We have a very, 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 very large gardens here in uh, Midland. And this Whiting Forest is kind of a spot where I really like to go and just relax. It's so relaxing. And if you get there early enough, you can listen to the birds. Birds just they'll sing for you, and it's, it's just, it's a peaceful place, let me tell you. You need to unwind, and we all need to unwind at times. It's a great place to go. Well, let me start off with, I just, I finished this book. So What? This is a biography of Miles Davis. This was a great read. You know, I've read his autobiography. I've read a book about all the different articles he's done for Downbeat and all that. They, they put them all together. Uh, this this was a biography. So, you know, you have your autobiography. This is what Miles is talking about. He's talking about late in his life. He was having a lot of health issues and stuff. Uh, this this gives you a different perspective with him. It, it, was, it was the best. Man, I love this book. I learned so much. I thought my head was going to explode how much I was learning. It was a really incredible book. So if you ever happen to see it, if you like jazz, if you're interested in Miles Davis, and you want something that's not like mind-blowing, you know, complicated, <laughs> what are you talking about? This is a great one. So what? Miles Davis, highly recommend it because I liked it. How about a couple call-outs on a couple shit channels real quick? I'll write their names down below. I would say I'll put in their link, but every time I try, I, I just, folks, I'm just stupid. I can't figure it out, man. Uh, but uh, this one, uh, gal, she's, her name's Nicola, and she's, you know, Nicola, you, you've subscribed for me for quite some time. I didn't know you had a channel until last night. I said, what? And her name or channel, and I, I'll probably say say the second part of it wrong. Rex Reliquary, Reliquary, R E L I Q U A R Y. It's down below. Take a look. Uh, it's Nicola's channel. Uh, she's really been. Uh, she, she's been a great. Uh, she's always commented. You know, watches regularly. It's a great channel. One of the hands ladies. Uh, it was fantastic. And she likes the cramps. You like the cramps. You are on my A-list. And then I have Mary Haggerty. And, you know, Ron Haggerty's been in the VC for a lot, for a very, very long time. And, and Ron was one of my very first people to start watching my channel. One of the very first people to sub me. Uh, and I really appreciate that, Ron. Well, his daughter, his daughter's 15 years old. And so she started a channel. She has like 14 subs uh, let's 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 help her out give her some love man uh, she she's a breath of fresh air she's happy she's enjoying herself and that's what this is about isn't it we're doing music it's about enjoying ourselves so please check out those two I put their names below properly spelled yeah that you can check them out all right so we're going to get going here first off Sam, Vinyl Douche, he had a phenomenal, uh, it's a great channel, but he had, maybe a month back, he talked about a group he went into, it's called Ringo Death Star. You know, the, the name itself, how could you not like that name, Ringo Death Star? It was named after Ringo Star and Star Wars the Death Star. They put them together, there you go. And he talked about this group, and I, I was so intrigued by it, I went out and I went on to Amazon, I found, I could find vinyl. One, one of their albums was in vinyl, was Pure Mood by Ringo Death Star. 
Ringo Death Star, they are out of Austin, Texas. And it's kind of a, it's a shoegaze band. But these guys, you know, they're shoegaze. But these guys, shall we say, they add some more loudness to the whole thing. Uh, there's boy-girl vocals that are really nice, a little bit ethereal. I mean, they, they really work well together, kind of blissed out. But the guitars, my God, they're loud, they're crunchy going on, they're fuzzed out. Uh, it is just, it's, it's really interesting music. I totally, totally enjoyed this. Um, label, nothing special. Uh, black vinyl, because Vinyl Douche prefers black vinyl, right Sam, on here. Uh, it's this this was well worth picking up Ringo Death Star Pure Moods if you are into if you like the shoegaze movement or shall we say e even just I mean kind of uh, feedback distorted guitar work I think Jesus Mary Chain King bloody my bloody Valentine this is something this came out in 2015 this is their fourth album that they produced and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely look for more of this stuff from this group uh, called Ringo Death Star. What we're listening to in the background today is the group called the Dandy Warhols. Dandy Warhols, they started in 1994 out of um, Portland, Oregon. Uh, you know, they, they formed because they wanted music that they could drink to. They would go drinking, and there was no music they liked. So they go, well, let's just form our own band, and uh, we'll have some music that we can drink to. So, by God, they did that in 1994. Uh, and their early live shows, uh, they weren't so much known for the music as the fact that People tended to get naked in them. And I, I guess, you know, let me tell you, that's just sex, drugs, and rock and roll, baby. Uh, but you know, the, the clothes would just pop off during, during their shows. So it kind of got them a following going on. Uh, it was formed by a guy named Courtney Taylor Taylor. Yeah, why have, you know, it's just Courtney Taylor? It's add two Taylors to the last name. I don't get it, but... Hey, that's that, that that's fine. And uh, Peter Holstrom, I believe, was the other guy that's part of the founders of this group. Well, what you're listening to right now is their third album, and this is the third album here. It's called Thirteen Tales from Urban Bohemia, and this was their breakout album. Now, this is an alternative band, fairly psychedelic. Um, some considered stoner rock, not like Queen of the Stone Age, though. But these guys, they they do love their drugs. Uh, and if you ever, there's a video out there, and the song's on here called Godless. It's on YouTube. It's like. Wow, that is one strange video. Love the song, but your video it makes me not interested. I mean, it is odd. About guy, some guy's doing a hula hoop. It's just, wow, that's weird stuff. But this was their third album. And so they went, it became a little more power pop in here. There was a few more subdued songs, but just some great, great music. It, uh, it really hooked me onto this, and it was made in the year 2000, and the Dandy Warhols are still together. Uh, they had a huge hit off this. It's called Bohemian Like You, and that went on to, it became popular, I think, Buffy and the Vampire Slayer, some other TV shows. It's been played in movies, commercials. It really took these guys to a whole different level, uh, and it became Again, it's, it's a well-known song. You hear it, and you're going to say, oh, yeah, I know that song. Uh, so, you know, these, these guys are still out there, but I, I think they've made some incredible music. They, they've had a few stinkers. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but this here, 
Uh, you, you know, they have a greatest hits compilation that's really good if you just want to experiment. But if you had a place you wanted to start, this is a really, really neat album and well worth looking into. The Dandy Warhols, 13 Tales from Urban Bohemia. It, it, it is a favorite. So, you know, we got this Ringo Death Star that has some really cool stuff in there. That shoegaze, this thing here, great stuff. All right, time machine. Let's go back in time. Woo, 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 right? And let's go to 1961. But our tale begins in 1936 with the birth of Hank Mobley. So Chris, Tunes from the Man Cave, was talking about Hank Mobley a while back on his channel. And uh, he had just got in a new repress, I mean, an original repress of this album here from 1961 Workout. So he offered this one up for sale, and I jumped on it. And so he was, um, you know, I, I, I got this from him. Uh, really nice purchase, glad I got it, and sounds like he's going to be trying to sell off some more of his stuff as it gets original, so I eventually will have, you know, half of Chris's uh, collection probably here, so I appreciate Chris came in, great shape and all that. But Hank Mulvey was uh, 1936, uh, he died in 86, kind of young, uh, health, health issues. You know, he... When he was 16 years old, he got sick, and he was at home for a couple months. He couldn't leave home, so he was bored, so his grandmother bought him a saxophone, and he began to learn to play the saxophone, and he really, at his school, it wasn't much for him to learn when it came to like this band, so he bought books, or got books from the library, I don't know, he got the books, and he began to learn to play the saxophone from those and then of course he just took off and in the early 50s he was part of uh, Boar Silver and the Jazz Messengers and it was the start of hard bop so we had you know bebop going on but the hard bop came in which had more soul in it more blues type feel to it and Hank Mobley was one of the originators of hard bop now they call him the king of the the middleweight champion of the tenor sax. You had John Coltrane, who played really hard. He's the heavyweight champ. And there was Sam Getz, who's kind of the lightweight, more mellow champ. Well, Mobley was the middleweight champ. On, uh, you know, he produced, he made over 20 different albums and uh, for Blue Note. And I think this is his 17th one. Uh, in the early 60s, he played just for a little bit with Miles Davis. Miles Davis and him, whatever, they didn't get along, or uh, Miles wasn't that impressed. So, uh, you know, he didn't last long with that group. But on this one, this is, again, Workout. And this was in 19... came out in 1961. It's on, again, Blue Note. This is not an original. On this... He has, now this is this, this, this lineup for you jazz guys. Grant Green is playing guitar. Winton Kelly is on piano. Paul Chambers is on bass. And Philly Joe Jones is on drums. So like Paul Chambers and Philly Joe Jones talked about them last week. Uh, you know, again, for out of Miles Davis group. Uh, so they're, they're helping them off. And you know, Grant Green and Winton Kelly. So it's a power packed group. Nothing ever, None of the songs he did on this that he made became, shall we say, jazz standards, but this is one of his classic albums. If you're interested in the Tanner Sax and Hank Mulvey, Workout is a wonderful place to start. I mean, it's, it's a great album to begin a collection for this man. So, great things. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. I uh, really have been enjoying it. How about Miles Davis then? We talked about Miles Davis. Let's look at him. I got a promo here. And this is Miles Davis. This is his live album called Agnatha. Egg Harta. Egg Heart. Egg Heart. Egg. We're going to say it's called Egg Harta. And not, not as many people own this album, so I might get away with that one, huh? And it is a, there it is, the promo. 
This came out in, oh golly, 1975 it came out. Miles Davis is actually recorded, I believe, in 73. Uh, Miles is having a bad time. He has, he's having bleeding ulcers. Uh, he was, his hip, he had such problems with his hips and legs that he could barely walk at times. His hip kept popping him out, popping out. When he was in concert, so he had a Wawa pedal for his trumpet. He couldn't even use his legs to, you know, to change his, he'd have to get down on his hands and knees to hit the Wawa pedal. Uh, he was drinking extremely heavily. He was on morphine, codeine. Uh, so he was just having a terrible time. Well, he was in Japan and he did a concert. Actually, a number of concerts, but this one was recorded uh, along with another one that became live albums. It took a year and a half for this to come out. I mean, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're just going, God, do we release this or not? But after he did these concerts, he went into a six-year uh, a, a six retirement phase where basically he locked himself in his house, in a very dark house. And he always had to have someone with him, but, you know, he was just kind of, uh, just, he, he was struggling uh, mentally. Guy liked candy, though. Uh, and uh, he was diabetes and just so many problems on it. But... They did this album, and on this album here, what makes this different is, he actually does, we have Sonny Fortunes on the sax, Michael Henderson bass, Peter Cozy guitar, Al Foster drums, Reggie Lewis guitar, uh, water drum, rhythm boxes, mute conga. This is a dense album. Miles playing is very minimalist and very repetitive, you could say. There's twin guitars going on, so it makes it really dense. At the concerts, he was getting booed. People were walking out while some other people absolutely loved it. It's almost more of a rock album to some extent. It is, if you like the Miles Davis in the 60s, 70s, um, 60s and 50s, not, you, may, you may not like this. I, I enjoyed it though. I mean, I and I and I, and I love that era of it's something different. But it's met, it's never been for everyone. Uh, Egg Harta. Egg Harta actually. Uh, what's that mean? It was. It deals with drawing in celestial radiance, and the celestial radiance creates peace, and all the races get along. So it's kind of a peaceful thing that way. So. Came out, took a year and a half, but finally it was put out. Uh, and it's a live album. 1975. Okay. Rob from Boston. You're going to know him. Mission of Burma. Okay. Uh, Mission of Burma. Post punk out of Boston. They started in 1979. They made a, they had an EP that started, Signals, I got that in CD, and then they had this verse. This, for those of you that like post-punk music, this came out, I believe, in 81. It is an extremely important album. I mean, it is a classic of uh, post-punk of the early uh, of the early 80s and late 70s mission of Burma could re but I'm not reviewing that album I'm reviewing this one this came out in record store day so they were on this label and the label was called ah uh, gee whiz let me think ace ace of hearts and the owner of it his name was ace hearts was the producer well, Mission of Burma, they had done some different singles, but they had some other people produce them. Well, the guy, the owner of Ace of Hearts, Ace Hearts, said, no, nope, not going to put them out. Well, I'm only putting out music I produce. Obviously, he wants the moolah. So they never went out. Well, these guys didn't last. I think in 83, they broke up because their lead singer, Roger Miller, developed tinnitus. You know, that ringing in the ear, and it was so bad, they had to stop. But well, they did reform back in uh, 2002. So they broke up in 83, but they had these singles. What well, Tang Records got a hold of us and said, you know what? 
we would love to put out those singles. And so they did. And they put them out the singles. They made some EPs. Well, this puts them all together. This is a record store day release. Nothing special. It does say tang. And it puts out the various singles that they put out through their career. It has, well, just kind of a, a tang thing there. Advertisement. And along with that, we have Mission of Burma. Looks like a little concert photo, doesn't it? Peking, Peking, Peking Spring. And some information about the album. Wonderful post-punk music. Really happy to get this. I really enjoyed Mission of Burma. I, I thought they did some great stuff. I you know that early career was short-lived, but they did come back on. They have put out more music on there. Uh, really great listen. Truly happy to have that one there. joined the It's a Beautiful Day Club. This thing's been around the VC. I've seen it around a ton. I've never bought it. I've never had it. Uh, I might be one of the only people that have not had it, but it's not that expensive. I've seen it, and I was like, God, what a lame cover. That was about the, what a freaking lame cover. Why do I want that? But everyone's talked great about it, so I'm a visual guy. I like covers. By the way, this is that Dandy Warhol hit, um, New Bohemians. This is the one that became popular. I digress. All right, so these guys, San Francisco Band, 1967 is when they formed. Uh, it's kind of psychedelic folk. There's some classical type feel, a little jazz in there. Kind of all over the place. It's San Francisco. It's 67. You know, you're going to get kind of a potpourri of things. Uh, Mazzy, maybe, maybe you saw these guys back then. I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, Norman Maslow, check out his channel. Fun guy, likes martinis a lot on there. Well, this was their debut in 69. But when they started, they had this manager, and the manager's name was uh, Matthew Katz. Now, Matthew Katz was also managing Jefferson Airplane and um, Moby Great. They hated the man. They were trying to get rid of him. It's a beautiful day. Didn't know that. So they hooked up with him, and the problems began. The guys say, nah, you can't play around L.A. You can't play live. You guys got to get better material. You got to work up. So he put them to Seattle. And so up to Seattle, they went to try to work out and become a band. And these guys had no money. Uh, they had no jobs. And they're just trying to figure out how to make music. Well, eventually, they came back down and they began, you know, hitting clubs. I think they got rid of Cats. Well, this was their first album that came out in 1969. These guys played until 74. They broke up, and I believe back in around, I'm thinking 2000. Yeah, 2000, they reformed, and they're still out there, what I hear. So it's a, when I first listened to this, off Columbia, when I first listened to this, I wasn't impressed. Eh, okay, I mean, it wasn't like, oh, that makes me want to throw up. But it didn't do anything for me. Second time I listened to it, okay, hey, that's, that's not too bad. Third time I listened to it, hey, not, not bad at all. I, I enjoyed it. So this took a few listens for me to get into. Uh, it went to number 47, and actually the debut did well, and then they just kind of, you know, didn't do well didn't do that good they had a hit song on here called white bird uh white bird is a very sad song part of it part of the lyrics was formed when they were up in seattle and was raining all the time and just it was just darn depressing so that's where some of it came from but take a listen to that <laughs>
right, we are going to go into the next two. Getting along as always, I can't believe it. I got two albums from War here. I, I love the group War. You know, War was formed, actually 1962 was formed down in Long Beach, but they played more in Compton. Uh, they were, uh, they're called Creation, and they began going around Compton, playing in the ghettos. Well, and they, they lost their lead singer, so then they had, there was a football player named Deacon Jones in the 60s, and he wanted to sing. So he's singing and wars their backing band. Well, then a producer by the name of Jerry, Jerry Goldstein, I believe, he heard them and liked them, and him and Eric Burden thought, wouldn't these guys make a great backing band? So they did. They backed up uh, Eric Burden. Did two albums, touring with Eric Burden, you know, they had uh, Spill the Wine was their big hit. While they were touring with Eric Burden, after their second album, suddenly he disappeared. Suddenly they became just war, and they went out their south. Their first debut didn't do well, but then they began to take off. It's actually a very political band, but very upbeat lyrics. They're, they play rock and funk, and jazz is on here. There's reggae you're going to hear, r and B. I I mean, they Latin, they go all over. If you were to take all the members of war that they've had through the various incarnations, it would fill up a small phone book. There's that many. Well, this album here, back in 1975, this came out. And in 75, I was a sophomore in high school in Central City, Nebraska. Uh, not a town of about 2,500 people, okay? That was big in Nebraska, though. So I go to the Dairy Queen, and the Dairy Queen is where all the cool kids hung out, because they had a jukebox in the back, and all the cool kids, the guys, the, the guys that were jocks were there. The women, the girls who didn't wear bras were there. Well, some were cheerleaders. Most of them, I think, well, some of them didn't wear bras either. These are things a young sophomore sees and understands. Uh, but this is where they hung out. And I remember I went in there because I wanted to dilly part. That was intimidating because I was not one of the cool kids. I know, shock, shock, shock. I wasn't a cool kid, but I went in there is I wanted a dilly bar damn it So I went to get it and I hear the song. Why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? And I go that is just the neatest thing now. That's actually a political song. Okay, it's a very political song But it's just I didn't know it just sounded like a happy thing. Why can't we be friends? Hey you ladies without the bras and the guys that have they were really big. Why can't we be friends? And it caught my attention. And then they had a second hit off it. And I went out and I bought this. Lowrider. I bought that at a little uh, at our five and dime store in town. They had that. They didn't sell record albums, but they had that. So that's Lowrider that I bought back when I was a kid as a sophomore. My paper out money. Uh, so I finally saw this thing and I was happy to get it. Uh, and it even had a poster in here. There we go. So again, uh, two uh, two Grammys. They they actually they were up for a Grammy for Why Can't We Be Friends and Low Rider. Their 1973 album, The World Is a Ghetto, was the best-selling album of '73. Great listen. Then in '70, this count '75. In '77, they came out with this Galaxy. This is more of a disco. The cover is great on here. You even got the Ku Klux Klan waiting in line. You, this looks like from Wizard of Oz. You have Frankenstein monsters. Uh, came out in uh, 77. More disco. Galaxy it comes because it's based off of Star Wars. Yes, Star Wars was big in 77. And War goes, we got to do something with Star Wars. So they did. They made Galaxy. It's not a bad album. You know, it was kind of... War was struggling more because the jazz funk had died out and disco was in. But I enjoyed that. Final couple albums. Lac La Belle. Lac La Belle. These guys, this is a duo out of Detroit, Michigan. And it's a more Americana type music on here. This is their 2014th album. And it is their um, fourth album. Yeah, it came out in 2014. Uh, just... What are their names? Uh, it's Jeannie, Jeannie, I'm trying to think here. 
Genie Nags, I believe, and uh, Mark. No, Nick. Nick. Sh no, I'll. <laughs> I, I can't remember their names. Uh, not that it matters. But I, it just a lot of great. They, they go, you know, there's history in here. They take old songs. Um, some of them are historic songs. I have. I, it was one of those things I, I just kind of, wow, that is really, really nice. I'll play you a snippet of it because obviously these guys are not well known out there. Uh, and, and I totally enjoyed it. There they are. Isn't, aren't, don't, don't they look happy? They play in a variety of other bands too on here. Jeannie Nags and Nick Shilas. Shila, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> I forget that name. It's not going to happen. Again, it's it's just good folk Americana type music, old timey music. I'm going to show it, it isn't like this is a classic but there's there's reasons for everything we show isn't there and BJ Thomas rate drops keep falling on my head not that I'm a BJ Thomas fan but I bring this up because in life remember in school you had to go to chorus. You went to chorus when you were in grade school. You had to go to chorus when you were in junior high. In senior high even, I think you had to go to chorus for a while, at least where I grew up. And there were certain songs in chorus that you had to sing. One of them we sang there in little central city of Nebraska was, Wars the World is a Ghetto. What did we know about the ghetto? Nothing. But we sang about it. The world is a ghetto. I'm sure that the parents are going, that's great. What, what, what are you singing? But here was the big one. Raindrops keep falling on my head. We sang that in chorus. And there's just a bunch of, I was in junior high and we're there, raindrops keep falling. I mean, we got into raindrops keep falling on our on my head. That was just, that was powerful stuff. The rest of the album I, I didn't like. May never listen to it again. Don't know, but I now have raindrops keep falling on my head to relive my junior high. Boom, that's it over 30 minutes <sighs> well what are you going to do so i hope you enjoyed it a lot of great stuff there looking forward to got man i got a lot of stuff stacked up i went by five record stores this last week five three of them i've never visited i didn't go into any of them trying to trying to save a little money going to orlando in a few weeks and so cutting back trying to but i got so much stuff to show and some new stuff i still haven't listened to so we're going to keep it rolling, keep it going. And thank you all my new subscribers. Getting closer to 1,000, but still got 170 to go. Working on setting up something for a cool contest once we hit 1,000. Uh, appreciate everybody. Uh, keep the videos coming. Really enjoying everything. Enjoy your week. Hope you have a great one. Thanks for watching. Bye.